Good evening, everybody, um, and welcome to this webinar about restorative aquaculture in California. My name is Luke Gardner, and I'm a Extension Specialist for California Sea Grant based at Moss Landing Marine Labs, and your co-host for this evening. Uh, joining me in this role is Kevin Marquez Johnson, also a California Sea Grant Extension Specialist at um, Cal Poly at San Luis Obispo, and Emily Pomeroy, the Program Manager at Save Our Shores. Emily is standing in for Catherine O'Day this evening, if she has a prior commitment. First, just a few housekeeping items. Um, during this webinar, all audience members will be muted and your cameras are off. The webinar will be recorded for future reference and available on the California Sea Grant website. Audience participants will not be recorded. There'll be a little time for questions after each presentation. Um, please use a Q uh, the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen to add your question. Um, feel free to add at any time during the presentation and webinar. Myself and some of the moderators will select a couple of questions from the audience and put them to the panelists during the allotted Q&A time. Otherwise, the panelists will try and answer the other questions in the Q&A box during the webinar. So now just a quick note about the event. This is a co-sponsored webinar between uh, California um, Sea Grant and Save Our Shores. Emily Pomeroy in a moment will tell you a little bit about Save Our Shores and their interest in restorative aquaculture. But first off, I want to introduce you to California Sea Grant. At its core, California Sea Grant is an organization that unites the uh, resources of the federal government, the state of California, and universities across the state to create knowledge, products, and services that benefit the economy, the environment, and the people of California. One of our focus areas at California Sea Grant is sustainable uh, development of aquaculture. In particular, there is increasing interest in restorative aquaculture. For the purposes of purposes of this webinar, we're considering restorative aquaculture to mean generally the culture of aquatic organisms that lead to a net benefit for the environment. As you will hear in this webinar, this can mean restoring populations of native species using aquaculture or commercially harvesting and farming animals to restore an ecosystem at large. So California Sea Grant and Save Out Shores want to organize this um, webinar in order to tell you a little bit about what's going on in the state with regard to um, restorative aquaculture. So now just a quick word from Emily Pomeroy from Save Our Shores. Thank you, Luke, I'm happy to be here. As Luke mentioned, my name is Emily Pomeroy and I'm the program manor at, manager at Save Our Shores, a 501c3 coastal conservation organization serving the central coast of California with a mission to steward clean shores healthy habitats and living waters to foster thriving marine ecosystems. With such a mission, it should, should not be surprising that we're a strong promoter of restorative aquaculture as it can provide ecosystem services, including habitat benefits for fish and other marine life, which you will learn about from our speakers this evening. We're delighted to be closely aligned with the aquaculture work going on both at Moss Landing Marine Labs and the Un University of California, Santa Cruz in collaboration with the California Sea Grant Program. As one of the relatively few nonprofits advocating for restorative aquaculture along our California coast, Save Our Shores is also working closely with these same organizations to plan a non-governmental organization only forum focused on building a pro-aquaculture coalition in our state, which we hope we'll be able to host live sometime next year. In the meantime, we're very excited to co-host tonight's webinar and we thank you all for tuning in. Luke, back to you. Thanks, Emily. And so first off, we have uh, Kristen Aquilino. She's the lead scientist at the White Abalone Breeding Program at UC Davis Bodega, Bodega Marine Laboratory. The presentation is entitled, Making Haste at a Snail's Pace, Saving the Endangered White Abalone. Take it away. Thanks so much, Luke. Um, so, like Luke said, I'm Kristen Aquilino. I'm director of the White Abalone Captive Breeding Program for UC California, or U University of California Davis, and the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. I'm also a California Sea Grant Extension Specialist, and I'm based at UC Davis Bodega Marine Lab, which is about an hour and a half north of the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco. Um, our space occupies the ancestral and traditional land of the Coast Miwok people, for whom abalone are incredibly important. And at the end of my talk, I'll post a few links to related resources in the chat. Um, one of them will be for an article by a local Coast Miwok and Southern Pomo person, Jacqueline Ross, about the importance of abalone to native people. So when anyone I talk to thinks about abalone, um, 
they, some people have no idea what they are. I grew up in the Midwest. I had no idea what an abalone was until my early 20s. Um, and even those people who have close relationships with abalone often think of what is on the screen right now. Um, it looks a lot like a rock with maybe some things growing on it. Maybe there's some holes there that indicate it's an animal and some fringy tentacles going on around it. Um, but this is what I think of when I think of an abalone. Um, they have these derpy faces with beady eyes, these long tentacles, this strong muscular foot that helps them hold onto the rock in the wild and is actually quite tasty when we eat it. Um, there are actually seven species of abalone in what is now North America. And most of them have suffered from extreme overharvest and also many of them from disease as well. So white abalone and black abalone as a result of these stressors are now federally listed as endangered. And we have a, humans have a really strong history with these animals. Um, it's cultural, it's economic, it's ecological, and all of these things kind of blend into one another. Um, I like to say that abalone are incredible interior decorators, which is one of the reasons why we as humans care about them. They create this really beautiful, lustrous shell. Um, their, their meat has been really important for sustenance. Um, it's really healthy, it's delicious. And I also like to call abalone the Zambonis of the seafloor because they do a really good job of maintaining this really important habitat of crustose coral and algae. That algae is basically a landing pad for lots of invertebrates to settle. And when we have healthy abalone populations, we tend to have healthy coastal ecosystems. Um, there's a lot more to this history of abalone and why we care about it. Um, one of the links I'll put in the chat at the end is to this book called Abalone, which came out this year by Ann Delisis. And it really goes into depth about the history of, of abalone in this area and why they are so important to us. And like I said, the main reason for abalone decline in this area is overfishing. So the main fishing was happening between the 1940s and the 1970s. This picture here is from Santa Barbara around the 1940s. And this was a common sight during that time, just piles and piles of shells, um, clearly from what we know today, not sustainable. So what about this white abalone? I mentioned it's one of seven California species. It's the deepest of all of those species and it was actually the last to be fished. Um, but once it was fished, it was targeted because apparently it's the most delicious, the most tender, and it fetched the highest price at market. So where we think there were once millions of snails, we think there are now only a few thousand. And we know that the commercial landings for white abalone exceeded 280 metric tons. And now there are fewer than two metric tons remaining. So that's a 99% loss in just about a decade. We really fished almost all of these animals. And the ones that are left are at an incredibly low density, so low that they are not able to reproduce on their own. Abalone are terrible at long distance relationships. They need to be very close together in order to spawn and reproduce successfully. So basically the ones that are left in the wild, those few thousand, they haven't been able to reproduce successfully. And that is one of the main reasons that a number of stakeholders, um, interested parties got together in the late 90s and attempted to list this species. And in 2001, it became the very first marine invertebrate to be federally listed as endangered. We thought at the time, it should be a relatively easy species to save. Their habitat is intact. Um, and not only are there abalone on every continent except for Antarctica, there are abalone farms on every continent except for Antarctica. We know how to do aquaculture for this species. So let's take those best methods, apply them to the white abalone and put them out in the wild. And so this is just a, a picture of what that might look like. Bring some wild broodstock in from the remnants of the, cap, of the wild population, put them in a farm type situation, make a bunch of babies and put them back out. And this, this story is kind of how things started. So in the year 2000, we collected about 20 wild white abalone that were left in the remnant population, brought them into a captive facility in Southern California, spawned them and created over 100,000 juveniles. It was quite successful. Unfortunately, when those animals were about a year old, 95% of them died from disease. This disease is called withering syndrome. It's interesting because it's temperature dependent. So when the animals are in cold water, they are apparently asymptomatic, even if they have this bacterium, Candidatus xenohaliotis californiensis, that causes the disease. But when they're in warmer water, they stop eating. And instead of having food to, to, to metabolize and um, and grow and do their business, they digest their foot muscle instead. So the top abalone here is a red abalone with a healthy foot, the bottom one has withering syndrome. And at the time we didn't really know what we could do about this. Um, we didn't know a lot about the disease, we didn't know how we could treat it, and it was a very big challenge for this program. 
In 2011, the program moved to UC Davis Bodega Breen Laboratory, where I am now, partially because of our expertise in reproduction and development of invertebrates, partially because of our expertise in ecology of outplanting of things like abalone, but also because we house the state's health, shellfish health pathologist, Dr. Jim Moore. And he and his colleagues were instrumental in identifying and tracking and learning to treat this disease, weathering syndrome. They actually developed an antibiotic bath treatment, put the animals in that bath treatment, it rids them of the bacterium, they're healthy, and become more reproductive. Um, the other thing that Jim and his colleagues developed was a shell waxing treatment. So one of the pictures here in this pathology circle is of a damaged white abalone shell. That's because a lot of animals can bore into abalone shells like clams and worms and sponges, and that makes the shell brittle, opens up space for disease. So Jim and his colleagues developed this waxing treatment, which is a combination of organic coconut oil and or, um, organic beeswax, it smells quite lovely. We can paint it on the shell once or twice a year. It suffocates those boring organisms. And then again, they're healthy, which is really, really important for them to become reproductive. And I like to say that between these cleansing antibiotic baths and these exfoliating waxing treatments, we are like the Sonoma County Spa Retreat for white abalone. We have the most pampered snails in the world here at our lab. And of course, we're not doing this alone. So we have state and federal agencies. NOAA is the head of this program. California Department of Fish and Wildlife is heavily involved in this program. We have aquariums, we have aquaculture farms, we have other universities and science institutions that are involved in this work. Um, just like you don't have all your eggs in one basket, you don't keep all of your in endangered animals in one tank on the San Andreas Fault, or is where, which is where I'm standing right now. So this is a, a very large effort that goes all up and down the coast of North America. And we've been quite successful. So when I started in this program in 2012, which was our first spawning season, um, we created about 20 adult white abalone that year. Um, it was not gonna save the species to create 20 more a year, but it was really exciting because it'd been nearly a decade since they'd reproduced successfully in captivity, mostly because of these disease challenges. And we've steadily increased our production every year since. So we're creating now a brown 30,000 adult white abalone or one-year-old white abalone every year. And my job as a scientist is to figure out how to increase that number because we think we need to create around 100,000 white abalone every year that will be put out in the ocean in order to save this species. So how do we go from 30,000 to 100,000? There's a number of different aspects that we're looking at to try to increase this production um, that are listed here. One of them is reproductive conditioning. So to get these animals to spawn, it's a really romantic process. We put them all in their own buckets. We give them this love potion of hydrogen peroxide solution and they give us whatever gametes they have. But oftentimes that's not very many. So for the first few years I was with this program, we were getting around 600,000 eggs per female we should be getting millions of eggs per female. Often males weren't even spawning. So when we only have one chance a year to spawn them because we think these animals tend to only reproduce in the late winter to early springtime, what can we do to let them know the few months before that, hey, spring is coming, invest in your gonad. Um, do you need a certain diet? Do you need a certain temperature? Do you need a certain photo period or day length to let you know that it's about time to reproduce? Um, so we're, we're, we're messing with those kinds of variables to see what the sweet spot is for reproduction. We have another bottleneck at post-settlement survival. So the life history of these animals is that these, they're broadcast spawners. They send their eggs and sperm into the water column. Those eggs and sperm combine to form an embryo, which sinks to the bottom of the ocean for about 24 hours. And then a swimming larvae hatches out. That larvae has a yolk from its mom, kind of like a chicken egg. So it doesn't eat the whole time it's swimming. At the end of about a week, it finds a place to settle in that encrusting coral and algae that other abalone have maintained for it. And it metamorphoses into something that swims, from, into, from something that swims and doesn't eat to something that crawls and eats for the first time. We expect 95 to 99% mortality naturally from that. So what can we do to get them through that bottleneck? Is there a first food we can get them, give them to help them transition better? Um, is there a more cushy larval condition that we can give them so that they don't use up as much of that yolk? Can we feed moms different diets so they can provision their eggs with better yolk to get them through that transition? Our next question we have is genetic integrity. There are very few of these animals left in the wild. And so we're trying to save a species, not just individuals. What does the genetic pool look like for those animals? Um, the captive animals we have right now, um, of those, the broodstock, it only represents about 10 total animals. Um, so how can we get them to have more of those? Are better genetic integrity. And then we're thinking about climate change. These animals are going into a very different ocean than what their parents and grandparents experienced. So how can we prepare them for that and prepare our restorative aquaculture for that? I'm gonna breeze through these last two slides here. One really exciting thing is that we have started to outplant these animals a year ago this month. We put some of the first ones out in the ocean. Um, and I'll share a news story by Rosanna Shia um, that 
she put in the, in the LA Times last year. So you can read more about that. And it's going pretty well. So we've, we've seen some of these animals out there in the ocean and hopefully soon they'll contribute to the wild population. So my take homes here are that one, white abalone are culturally and economically and ecologically important. They will go extinct very soon without our help. It is very critical to do the work that we were doing. And in restorative aquaculture, we have the tools to save white abalone and it should be a relatively easy species to save. Finally, the knowledge and resources that we're using to help save white abalone in the wild will enhance the sustainability and security of our abalone fisheries and aquaculture. So with those take homes, um, I'd like to say that again, I'll post some resources in the chat. If you'd like to learn more, you can also follow us on social media, um, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or TikTok. And my email address is also here if you'd like to follow up. Thank you very much for that, Kristen. That was very good. We've got um, a couple of questions. Um, one uh, from the audience is, uh, with rising ocean temperatures due to climate change, how do we continue to com combat the abalone withering syndrome? That's a great question. And actually, um, I did bring a friend here to help answer some of these questions. So I'm just going to hold this up here as I answer questions. Um, one great thing for a lot of wild abalone about um, the withering syndrome or the concern about withering syndrome is actually in the past five or so years, we've discovered a bacteriophage, a virus that attacks the bacteria and that causes withering syndrome. And for most abalone species, this is conferring resistance to the disease for those species. So for example, when we had the warm water blob and the El Nino come through a few years ago, we didn't really see any mortality at all that we contributed to withering syndrome. White abalone don't seem to get the same resistance from the virus um, or the bacteriophage but we will be outplanting them in places that they lived historically, which is in cold water um, and, and places where it doesn't get warm enough for them to actually get the disease, even if they have the bacterium. Thank you. Um, another question I have is, um, because white abalone are listed as an in federally endangered species, does that make it harder to do this kind of work with them or easier? That's a great question. Um, there are certainly some more hoops occasionally to, to jump through. Um, I hold the permit for captive white abalone and there, there's a lot of reporting that needs to happen. There's a lot of restrictions on what we can and can't do for this species, um, but it also protects them and their habitat in a way that wouldn't happen otherwise. So I think that you know, for other, other abalone species, there's been some consideration about whether or not they should be listed. Does that actually impede their restoration or not? I think it's really species specific and people need to think about what, where are we with them? Um, what state are they in? For a white abalone, they were dire enough that I think it was really important that they were listed even with those extra hoops to jump through to save them. Great, one final question I think. Uh, we've got a couple here. Um, are there any other efforts to restore other species of abalone? Uh, I'm assuming in California. Yes, many. So there's a group trying to restore green abalone called Get Inspired, led by Nancy Caruso. Um, there are groups in Washington with the Puget Sound Restoration Fund doing restoration of pinto abalone. Um, and like I said, black abalone is also a species that's been federally listed as endangered. Um, so there's thoughts about how we might restore those. And then with the kelp die-off in Northern California over the past few years, um, the red abalone population has declined significantly. And so there are some thoughts about, can we use restoration aquaculture for that species as well? Great, we've got time for a couple more questions. You're very efficient in answering them. Um, one question we have is how similar is white abalone aquaculture to uh, other species? Uh, so we basically take the best methods from reds and try to apply it to whites. One difference is that red abalone seem to become reproductive throughout the year. Um, whereas white abalone seems to be mostly in the late winter to early spring time. So you maybe have fewer chances to reproduce them throughout the year. Um, the biggest difference in terms of practical, um, practical spawning and culturing is that red abalone, at least until recently, could take whatever broodstock they wanted from the ocean within reason, um, with, with permission from Cal Fish and Wildlife. And we're really restricted in what broodstock we have. So they have many more animals to choose from when it comes to spawning and they tend to have much more success. Fantastic. Um, one last question. Uh, let's go with, um, has there been any research into the impact of pollutants on disease susceptibility or long-term restoration goals? Um, I haven't been involved in any research related to pollutants other than CO2. Um, climate change is obviously a big concern for these animals. Um, we do know that there are some pollution issues in Southern California where, where these animals are native to. 
Um, we are at least at the get-go trying to choose restoration sites that are really healthy or as healthy as they can be relatively intact. Um, but that is something that we should consider as we continue down this path of putting them back on the ocean. Okay, thank you very much, Kristen, for that. Um, we'll move on to our next speaker. So our next speaker is um, Kirstine Wasson. She is the research coordinator at Elkhorn Slough National Estuarine Research Reserve. And the title of her presentation is Using Aquaculture to Save Native Oysters from Local Extinction in a California Estuary. Thanks, Kirsten. Thank you, Luke. So I'll tell you another conservation aquaculture story for recruitment limited species. And what I'm talking about are oysters, which are foundation species generating structured habitats in squishy mud flats. And the oyster that is native from Baja California to British Columbia is the Olympia oyster, Austria lurida or Oli. And Oli's have been a part of our Pacific coast estuaries for thousands of years, interacting with human beings. They were harvested sustainably by native peoples for millennia. And um, indeed they are tasty and were the basis of the first commercial aquaculture on this coast um, after the gold rush. But nowadays, if you eat an oyster in a California restaurant or West Coast restaurant, you're likely to eat the Asian species, Crassostria gigas, which is grown in most of our estuaries for aquaculture. There's very little Olympia oyster aquaculture. Olis typically form small clusters, not the big high profile reefs that Crassostria, say if you've been to Chesapeake Bay that you might've seen there. But they can be very abundant when the conditions are right, such as here in Vancouver Island. There's been a big decrease in their distribution and abundance, oysters around the world, but this oyster species too. For instance, they've disappeared from three California estuaries where they used to occur. And the estuary where I work, Elkhorn Slough in the middle of Monterey Bay, um, may, may end up being on that list unless we can help out. So um, when I first started working on Olympia oysters, I estimated the population size at 5,000 by doing surveys all around the estuary. And now there are fewer than 1,000 live oysters in the estuary. So why don't Olympia oysters always look like this? What are the challenges they face at Elkhorn Slough and, and elsewhere? One challenge is water quality. Hypoxia in particular can limit oysters out when there's fertilizer fueling algal growth. By day, there's a lot of oxygen, but by night, um, there's, there's a reduced oxygen goes to zero in some places. So if we step back and think about how that happened, it's due to human activities, especially water control structures and diking that can lead to stagnant conditions, as well as nutrient and contaminant inputs to our estuaries. And I just want to be very clear that the best way to restore oysters would be to restore healthier ecosystems with processes like this. Another problem facing our Olympia oysters is that they can get buried in goopy mud. Um, so when mud flats are firm, the oysters can survive in little clusters on gravel growing on each other. But in oysters with goopy organic mud like Elkhorn Slough, pretty much the only thing you see them on are large artificial substrates. So not what they used to be on historically um, because that's how they avoid getting buried in the mud. Again, if we step back and look at how that happened, factors like erosion of sediments from the watershed can increase the mud. But again, also those fertilizer inputs that can grow a lot of organic material that then decays can give you the, the goopy conditions. So once again, restoring those processes is ultimately what we wanna do for the oysters and biodiversity overall. But those are slow processes. And so in the shorter term, the typical restoration approach for oysters is to provide them places to grow to keep them out of the mud. 
where you have gentle slopes and your mud isn't too thick, you can just add shells, such as here in Neatarts Bay, Oregon, or this was scaled up hugely in some sites in Washington where a lot of Crassostria shell has been added to provide substrate for oysters. In places with goopy mud, however, such as San Francisco Bay, you can't just add shells um, and different approaches are taken, such as making these artificial reefs out of stacked bags of Crassostria shell or out of concrete that is made out of local um, sediment. But since I work on a nature reserve, we need to try to restore natural habitat conditions and we aim for low profile beds that mimic the, the way um, the oysters would have grown a few hundred years ago. And we use native clamshells that are abundant in the estuary because sea otters forage on them. And we attach them to wooden stakes and put those out in the mud flat, mimicking the natural clusters. So in restoration, there's this hope that if you build it, they'll come. But unfortunately at Elkhorn Slough, that's generally not the case. And that's because there's one more challenge that I need to tell you about. And of course, with the theme of this uh, webinar, you can guess what it is, which is reproduction. So Olympia oysters brood, these adorable little shelled babies that are then released into the water column so males release sperm, females brood the, the shell larvae, which are released and settle. And when we monitor them, this can be done very simply. I buy tiles at Home Depot and put them out one year, and then I check them a year later. And any oysters that are on them are a sign of successful reproduction in that year. In a good year, you get settlement of oysters. And in just a few months, oysters are covering those recruitment tiles. But that happened the very first year I monitored recruitment. We had hundreds of oyster recruits per, per tile, per meter squared. And it happened again in 2012. But pretty much in every year since 2012, there has been failure of reproduction in the entire estuary. I have seen one single oyster baby on hundreds of tiles that I've checked since 2012. And that has consequences for our adult populations. If you look at um, adult densities, you can see they've dramatically decreased since that uh, major recruitment event. And all oysters in the estuary today are at least eight years old, if not more for many of them. So I was interested in the causes of this reproductive failure and collaborated with people who had recruitment data up and down the coast and um, the gist of our, our story on this is that poor recruitment is predicted by strong marine influence, such as we have at Elkhorn Slough, thanks to some jetties, and limited adult distribution. We can't easily address the strong marine influence, but we can increase that adult distribution. And so that's where the conservation aquaculture comes in, which is what we've done now for Olympia oysters at Elkhorn Slough, in partnership with Moss Landing Marine Labs, Sea Grant, with funding from Anthropocene Institute and many partners. So we collected adults, brought them to the hatchery and warmed them up and fed them lots of food. And under those conditions, they reproduce just fine, uh, release sperm and then larvae. The larvae need lots of food, lots of algal food and a shout out to the team that took care of all those larvae. And we hung the same clam shells in the tanks with the larvae to provide them a place to settle. And then when they were dime to quarter sized, we engaged the community in a restoration event and um, they were involved assembling the oysters onto the clamshells onto the wooden stakes and measuring and counting how many we had initially and then helping us to deploy them to those muddy environments. And we deployed them in October, 2018 and then continued to measure and count the oysters in the subsequent months. And this photo sort of tells the whole story that we had good growth and good survival of those hatchery grown oysters. So if you look at size in millimeter from when we deployed them to less than a year later, they were at reproductive size. And if you look at numbers per stake, you can see there was a fairly modest decline. Their survivorship was good. So we're very excited to have created the first new cohort in this estuary since 
2012. But this was a pretty small proof of concept and our next step is to scale this up to build a self-sustaining population at Elkhorn Slough, which we think might be 100,000 or a million oysters. And what we're shooting for is, is this sort of a dense um, clusters of oysters in Elkhorn Slough. We're gonna do some experiments to try to enhance hatchery success and understand the factors that limit reproduction, altering temperature and food and so on. And one thing we're very excited about in a pending grant proposal, we have funding to partner with the Amamuts and Tribal Band to engage their native stewards in stewardship of coastal resources on their ancestral lands. So that is my case study of conservation aquaculture. Thank you very much for that, Festine. Um, just a quick reminder, if you have any uh, questions, um, please put them in the Q&A box and um, our panelists will endeavor to answer them. But uh, one question that we got that I think is related to this and not the prior presentation, are there any um, issues with increased acidification in the ocean for the, um, the, the Olympia oysters and the subsequent aquaculture? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, any organism that is making a calcareous shell is potentially challenged by acidification. But the good news is that the Olympia oysters seem relatively resilient to that. We did some experiments looking at various climate related stressors like increased temperature and acidification versus non-climate related stressors. And it's actually the non-climate ones that pose the biggest threat for now maybe in part because the Olympia oysters brood their larvae. So they're laying down their first tiny fragile larval shell while still in the maternal environment. They're not as sensitive to acidification as the non-native species Crassostria. And this is actually one reason we've been trying to encourage commercial aquaculture of the native species. It might benefit growers to have this resilient species in their portfolio and it might benefit the native species through a spillover effect of that larval recruitment. But for the next um, near future, fact, existing threats such as the diking and the polluted runoff um, pose a much bigger threat to them than either warming or acidification. Great, um, another question, um, are the uh, outplanted oysters protected against predation in any way? <laughs> no, right now they are not. And in that first batch we put out, the ones that were closest to a deep channel suffered some predation by sea otters, in fact. So one uh, threatened species eating another <laughs> threatened species in the estuary. And when we scale this up, we're gonna need to think about that and maybe create sort of dense clusters or maybe put temporary caging on until the oysters get to a certain size or pick areas that, that are not near channels uh, frequented by otters. But otters are our main concern. We do get some predation from raccoons coming from the, the other direction, the shore-based um, direction too. But right now, I think there aren't a lot of predators that are tuned into oysters since we haven't had many as as we create more oysters we may have more issues with that great uh, we have time for a couple more questions um one of the uh, audience members wants to know why do you think populations decline so rapidly from 2012 to uh 2020 i mean the the proximate cause is that they did not reproduce, that there's always some of the adults dying every year, maybe 10% of the adults die in any given year. And without the replenishment from recruitment, you're gonna have that population decline. Why we have not had successful recruitment anywhere in the estuary is a huge mystery to me. I can think of lots of explanations that would give you sort of less recruitment in some years, but we see this all or none situation where every site in the estuary in 2012 where I had tiles had oysters on it, and then none of the sites have oysters on it. So I, I am a bit puzzled what the all or none um, response is. My best guess might be that uh, we have these very strong tidal currents that the larvae get washed out to sea in most years unless they can happen to time larval release of a batch of larvae are released and can really rapidly get enough food to settle before the next strong tide series comes that might be a guess but i don't know it's a black box 
Okay, one last quick question, and there are a bunch of questions in there, so hopefully, Kirsten, you can answer these in it is, oh, I just saw it. Um, have the cultured and outplanted oysters um, in Elkhorn Slough managed to re reproduce in Elkhorn Slough yet? The short answer is we don't know. They're the size that they they can reproduce, but as I was just saying, in many years our oysters don't reproduce and we don't know, but um, we're working with a new student at Moss Landing Marine Labs, Jacob Harris, who will be doing some experiments to try to better understand why adults sometimes reproduce and why they don't, and, and maybe we'll learn. Thank you very much for that. Um, Okay, like I said, uh, Kirstine will attempt to answer uh, all those great questions in the, um, the Q&A box as we continue. But our next um, panelist is Renee Angwin. She's a laboratory manager at the Coastal and Marine um, Institute at San Diego State University. And her presentation is entitled, The Sushi Solution Using Row Enhancement Aquaculture to Aid in Kelp Forest Restoration. Sorry, technical difficulties, got it. <laughs> okay, um, so thanks Luke. Um, so my presentation is a little bit different. Um, we're not trying to put animals back out into the environment. We're actually trying to take them away, <laughs> which I'll explain a little bit later. Um, but basically, um, our project is one that we've been working on over the last few years in collaboration with several partners across the state. Um, collectively, we've been working on this unique aquaculture solution to try and help solve this massive urchin barren issue that has been rapidly spreading across the coast to the detriment of our essential kelp forest habits, habitats. And um, today, I'll just be sharing with you a small piece of this much larger project um, that we've been conducting specifically at SDSU. So as you may know, um, in California, we're experiencing an unprecedented ecological challenge, seeing the significant rise in overpopulation and overgrazing of our purple sea urchins in our kelp forests. And this has caused a significant shift from these once kelp dominated habitats to now urchin dominated habitats. And the subsequent establishment of these large persistent urchin barrens that are now devoid of kelp and their associated inhabitants. So during this shift, we've seen um, densities of urchins rise to over 60 times their historic levels, contributing to over 90% kelp forest loss in some locations, um, specifically in the north coast, but that's now spread down to the central and southern coast as well. Um, and these urchin barrens can be very, very difficult to reverse. So rightfully so, this has gained a lot of attention um, and there's become this critical need to try and find ways to reduce urchin densities and restore our productive, our productive kelp forest um, and all the ecosystem services that they provide. So the interesting thing about urchins is that they are indeed edible. Um, urchins are basically full of guts and gonads, um, but the latter part is the part that we eat um, as pictured in these orange lobes right here. Um, and these are also referred to as uni or ro in the seafood industry. And they're considered to be a delicacy in many Asian and European countries. That's almost always in high demand um, that can rarely be met. So similarly, um, although less popular in the United States, you can find uni served as sushi, sashimi, or maybe poke in seafood restaurants. Um, and the right hand picture is probably what you're familiar in seeing if you have eaten this, um, which looks maybe slightly more appetizing than just straight on gonads out of the shell. Um, so in general, because there's this edible delicacy, um, urchin aquaculture in general is something that is of high interest to a lot of countries to meet this really high demand. Um, however, urchins can be fairly challenging to grow and require a significant time investment. Um, so in theory, uh, if we're fishing on these urchins that are overabundant out of the oceans, uh, we can potentially solve two problems at once, right? This high demand for urchins and removing um, or reducing some of the densities of this overpopulated species. However, there's a caveat. So urchin gonad production is tightly coupled with their food availability. So an urchin existing under normal conditions in a healthy kelp forest would look something like this with um, plenty of gonads because they have plenty of access to their main food source of kelp. Um, however, urchins existing in a barren state subsisting on little to no food, as most of them are in uh, our California urchin barrens, are malnourished and completely devoid of roe, therefore are pretty valueless and considered to be a pest at this point. So despite this overabundance of an edible animal with potentially high market value, barren urchins are pretty useless at this point. 
So one of the ways that we can utilize urchins while also decreasing their densities is a new form of aquaculture called row enhancement aquaculture, um, which is also known as urchin ranching. So this is a concept that's been developed and successfully practiced around the world by countries like Norway and Japan. And the process basically involves harvesting these adult urchins out of their barren habitats, transferring them to land-based aquaculture facilities, feeding them and growing them to a desired yield, and then selling them as a farm seafood, either as a shell on product or maybe a, a process and packed product. So this is um, very different from standard or urchin aquaculture in that this process um, can take from uh, anywhere from several weeks to a couple of months, depending on the species you're working with and the method of enhancement, whereas traditional aquaculture that grows urchins from the larval stage to adult stage can take upwards of three years. So here at San Diego State University um, at the Coastal and Marine Institute, we've been working to develop this idea in California, um, testing this type of aquaculture and its compatibility with our native purple urchins. So with the help of our local commercial urchin divers to obtain urchins, um, we've been testing this concept using our fully enclosed recirculating aquaculture systems here in our lab. And we've been growing urchins on two different feed types. Um, the first, which is um, Macrocystis pyrifer or giant kelp, which is considered to be um, their natural and major food source here in Southern California. And then the second is this artificial pelleted feed that's actually produced by a Norwegian aquaculture company called Urchinomics. So we've been feeding these urchins. Um, the data set that I'm gonna share with you is the most complete data set that we've had from one of our feeding trials. Um, but we've basically fed these urchins over a period of nine weeks. And the way that we look at gonad growth is by calculating something called a gonad index, which is down at the bottom of your screen. It's basically looking at the gonad weight, the ratio of the gonad weight to the whole urchin weight. So when we started these feeding trials, um, we started with urchins that looked very much like this on the top of your screen that were about 7% gonad yield. And after feeding them kelp after these time periods, um, we saw this slight increase. And just to give you an idea of what we're aiming for, um, typical or what's considered good market size for an urchin is about 15% gonad in index. So over the nine weeks, um, we saw this slight increase in gonad yield um, feeding them just kelp. And if we assume a general linear increase over time, we might expect to reach this 15% gonad yield in about 15 and 18 weeks. What was really exciting about these feeding trials is that when we fed them this artificial feed that was specifically designed for urchins, we met this market gonad yield um, within the six week period and far exceeded it within the nine weeks. So this was really exciting. Um, for many reasons, not only the stark contrast between these barren urchins and these nice, full, healthy urchins, um, but it bodes really well for, quicking, for quickly turning over these urchins from this valueless, um, destructive pest into this viable, high-value seafood product, um, and also provides a strong case for using this artificial feed in commercial aquaculture applications, especially in areas where kelp may be limited or non-existent. So as any discerning uni connoisseur will probably tell you, it's not necessarily all about the quantity of the uni that you're producing, but more so the quality that makes it a good product. So while the uni that we produced looked really great um, in the pictures and in the pictures that I'm showing you um, on the top of your screen, we were also interested in confirming the quality of our urchin uni um, by performing some chemical analyses on their nutritional contents. So what we did is we tested um, these gonads and we extracted the moisture, the protein, the fats, and despite the fact that we fed them two very different types of feed, kelp, which is very carbohydrate rich and full of moisture, feed, which was a dried feed and very protein rich and uh, nutrient dense, um, the gonads that were resulting were nearly identical in their nutritional contents, um, regardless of the type of feed that we gave them. Now, if we break this down into uh, even further into amino acid contents, which we believe are largely responsible for this distinct flavor of uni, um, particularly amino acids that contribute to the unique umami, sweetness, and bitterness of uni, um, we see a very similar pattern in that both feed types, again, show these really similar results, suggesting that um, both kelp and this artificial feed um, were producing this similar quality uni. So this is actually really encouraging because it means that while we can produce a market size urchin in a shorter period of time using these artificial feeds, we're not necessarily sacrificing quality for quantity. So this is exciting um, in prospects for commercial upscaling, um, like I said, in trying to turn over these urchins very quickly in order to reduce their densities in the wild. Um, and we can really upscale this in high volume production um, in this row enhancement application. So how do we think that restorative aquaculture can have a good effect on kelp forests? Well, 
Evidence suggests that clearing urchins from barren habitats in a systematic way can have these positive effects on kelp regrowth. And so I just want to be very clear that we're not advocating to completely eradicate urchins, but rather we need to bring them down to a sustainable density so that they can continue to play their role um, in a balanced ecosystem. So just to drive this point home, I just wanted to share um, a really great example of a study performed by the Bay Foundation in the Palos Verdes Urchin Barrens down in Southern California in the L area. And this was a kelp forest restoration project that they conducted over the course of five years where they cleared urchins from um, their plots um, with densities as high as 100 urchins per meter squared down to what we think is a natural density down to two urchins per meter squared. Um, uh, and what they found is that over the course of their study, they saw the significant regrowth of giant kelp in just, you know, even several weeks. And, and this picture appears a nice before and after. Um, but more importantly, as they removed urchins, they saw this uh, regrowth of kelp. And they were able to restore about 56 acres of kelp within these areas, which is really exciting. Um, in addition to this kelp returning, we also saw the return of fish species and invertebrate species and algal species. So in general, we think that this method could really work in restoring our kelp forests. So um, in closing and, and in summary, I think that there are many benefits to this type of uh, row, enhancement, oh, sorry, row, row enhancement aquaculture. Um, and mostly in being that this process is actively removing these large amounts of urchins that are considered to be problematic from these urchin barrens, um, which is effectively alleviating the grazing pressure that the kelp is facing um, so it can allow it to regrow. The other big benefit is that it has a large economic benefit where we're leveraging this abundant resource to create a value valuable, um, high value product, um, where we can also um, use this to enhance the wild catch fisheries, you know, utilizing commercial urchin divers and their skills to help us um, take these urchins in and put them into our aquaculture applications, but also creating jobs surrounding the aquaculture industry that we can hopefully um, use these purple urchins to build as it grows. So with that, um, I will leave you with this beautiful picture of some of our homegrown uni and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thanks, Renee. That was great. Um, we have a few questions. Some of them are asking the same thing. I'm not sure if you can give us a satisfactory answer, but we'll ask it anyway. People want to know what the artificial feed is made from. Yes, of course. I get this question all the time. So um, it's a proprietary feed, so I can't tell you all the exact ingredients, but I can tell you that it is kelp based. Um, it's mostly made from um, human grade offcuts of Japanese kombu, which is laminary. Uh, well, so it was laminary and that's saccharina. So basically sugar kelp. So um, it's very nutrient dense, um, dried seaweeds packed into this little dense pellet that the urchins can feed on. Right. Um, another question. Uh, someone asks, is there much market for purple urchin uni? Um, they've heard that they're gonads are far less liked. They also ask, you know, could this be an artifact of harvesting urchins off or near barrens? Yeah, I mean, it's kind of a loaded question, but the basic answer is that no, right now purple urchins is not a huge market. There are um, some people that prefer purple urchins. And in fact, you know, in talking with a lot of commercial divers, they anecdotally, they say that purple urchins, when they're actually full and they have that row from healthy kelp forests, it's a little bit sweeter, it's a little bit um, less oceany tasting than the red urchins that we're really um, familiar with. But yeah, I mean, most of the purple urchins are exist in this barren state, right? So they're not really, um, very bad. They're, they don't give you a lot of bang for your buck. Um, the other thing is that they're a lot smaller. So in general, I think in order to get this um, working, we do need to develop a market with surrounding purple urchins, which is part of the challenge. But um, I can tell you that they are very tasty. Um, and uh, I, I preferentially like them a little better than the reds, but um, I might be hopefully, hopefully I'm not too biased, but I'm a little biased. <laughs> I agree. They, they do taste very nice. Um, another question we have, uh, is the idea for the urchin ranching uh, fishery, if you may, is it meant to be unsustainable? I.e., is it removing more biomass that can be replenished naturally? Um, and if that is the idea, will that create problems with management and with business later down the road? So I think if I'm understanding that question correctly, is this, I think they're asking if this is a sustainable um, practice. Um, and so removing purple urchins um, right now is highly sustainable. To give you an idea, um, just in the North Coast, we have about 3 billion urchins that need to be um, reduced so that we can regrow the bull kelp forest that we have basically lost. Um, 
and ranching sites have the ability to only reduce a fraction of that. So um, as far as removing so many purple urchins that we'd completely eradicate them, I don't think that's even a possibility within a few decades. So um, I think it's it's a sustainable practice and, and with management um, going along with that, we can definitely keep it to a point where it's not going to be a, a fishery that'll collapse like the red urchin fishery um, has. Um, and what was the second part of the question? I'm sorry. That was that was basically it. It was uh, the question was like, is it meant to be fished at an unsustainable level to reduce the urchins and bring the kelp back? And if that is the case, will that be a problem for this urchin ranching business later down the down the, the road? But it sounds like you think that there is that many urchins out there that that's a far off issue that I guess should be addressed. Is that accurate? Yeah, I mean, I guess just to follow that up, like I'd say that we work very closely with organizations like Reef Check and Fish and Game and several other marine labs, um, along with all the commercial urchin divers. And so we really are trying to do this in a systematic way where we're not just eradicating all the urchins. And that's why I made a point to say, like, that's not our goal. Our goal is to do this in a way that we reduce these urchins down to sustainable or, or more natural densities, I should say, so that they still have this important role in the ecosystem. Um, but hopefully that they might, maybe they could become a natural fishery down the line once we kind of get through the, uh, the barren ones. Okay, maybe time for one more question. Um, one of the audience member asks, um, a lot of questions about uh, the flavor and taste. So you had your your metrics in there, you know, based on amino acids and everything like that. Do you ground truth these things in a more subjective way with you know export buyers and chefs, what have you? Sorry, can you just repeat that? There was a little bit that I didn't hear. Sure. There's a, a lot of questions in here based on flavor and, and taste. You, you've done some research there based on amino acid profiles and things like that in a quantitative manner. How much have you ground truth this with uh, chefs and you know uh, exporters, people that gotcha. make a living out of this stuff? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, so I, of course, have um, tasted all the urchins that we've grown here. Um, that might sound gross, but I think it's an important part of the process to really know what you're going after. And when I first started this, I had never tasted an urchin in my life. And so um, I know what they taste like. I know what a good one is and I know what a bad one is. Um, but yeah, we do have some people that stop by the lab you know, when it's not COVID closed. And we've had people um, uh, in the um, seafood industry. So Catalina Offshore is another organization that we work really closely with. And they've kind of ground truth this and said, yes, like this is actually a really great product. And we do need to do some fine tuning, especially with methods and, and, and surrounding growing seasons and making sure that we're not getting urchins when they're reproductive. But as far as we understand, um, we're getting urchins that are really great, great quality. And the more we share them with um, people, like you said, chefs and seafood producers, um, we've gotten really great feedback back. So we think that we're on the right track. Um, it's just a matter of um, kind of just getting it exactly perfect because uni people are really, really particular. And so we need to get it right. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, we should move on here. You have got a lot of questions to rapidly answer there, Renee, in the, uh, the Q&A box, if you okay. could. Um, but yeah, what we want to do is wrap up here now with my, um, my counterpart, um, Kevin Johnson, who's also, like I mentioned, a California Sea Grant aquaculture specialist um, down at uh, Cal Poly there. And he's gonna give us a summary of what we've heard and where we're gonna go. Please take it away, Kevin. Yes, uh, thanks, Luke. Thank you uh, also to the whole panel for being here. Um, it's been a great day uh, hearing about all the awesome work that you have been doing. Uh, we had 184 people join us today, so uh, this is quite the crowd and really exciting to see how um, even in these COVID times we can communicate and share some of the really exciting work that's happening up and down our coast. Um, just to go over kind of what, what everyone has heard today, um, we had a series of talks, the first one uh, highlighting uh, these remarkably attractive uh, snails, a white abalone that's going extinct. Um, that's currently successfully being bred in captivity and has uh, an extensive amount of research going in to understand how can we maximize um, the, breeding, the breeding techniques that we're using, um, looking at genetic integrity, climate resiliency of these animals um, in order to start you know, furthering the outplant um, projects that are going on to recover this abalone species. And then um, as Kristen mentioned, you know, develop that into um, additional species 
that will be able to be recovered in these ways. Uh, we also heard about some amazing work with the Olympia oyster um, that has had a lot of work in hatcheries, uh, figuring out how to get these um, native oysters to not only complete their life cycle in um, aquarium, but also to get them to set and to develop in, uh, into adults in the wild and showing that that is actually feasible and that that's working in the Elkhorn Slough is, um, I think everyone in California should be excited about that and the prospects of being able to um, develop the Olympia oyster into a aquaculture species um, for restoration across our coastlines is um, something that we should all uh, be excited about. In addition to um, the connections with some of the uh, First Nations, the Amamutsun tribal band, um, the developing collaborations there, um, it's just um, excellent work that I'm glad uh, we were able to use this platform to um, disseminate. Um, and then the last talk that we heard this uh, talking about sea urchin ranching, I just love the idea of urchin ranching and I wish there was a picture of an urchin with a little cowboy hat and a little lasso. Um, I hope I'm not the only one that had that uh, vision in my head uh, when that uh, was being talked about. But th that this works is also just another really good sign for California that this is an option for helping to restore our kelp forests that are so important, not only for um, the water quality components that, they, that kelp forest brings, but also for the nursery, for the habitat that it provides uh, for our fisheries and um, for just biodiversity in general. Together, all of these talks, I feel, really um, highlighted the, the advances that we've had in um, research that is allowing us to cultivate these native and endangered species in um, closed, closed facilities um, and providing mechanisms through which we can bring these populations potentially back, hopefully to um, the level that they were before the impacts really started hitting them. And um, the solutions to that are going to be, have to be broad. Um, all of our speakers have talked about climate change and the impacts that um, our changing environment is having on the ecosystems that these organisms reside in. And as we move forward um, into the coming years, I think it'll be important uh, for continued work to be put towards making sure that the water that comes off of our lands and into the ocean is as clean as it can be. Um, and that's going to take concerted effort from multiple fronts, from multiple agencies. And what we heard today is how um, research and how um, research is, is combining with industry to come up with creative solutions. And that is what makes me most excited. And I hope it makes you excited as well that, that we are able to come up with creative solutions and being able to begin to implement those in our environment to restore California's ecosystem is our, uh, is our ultimate goal with restorative aquaculture. Um, all of these, these talks all build towards that. And so I'm glad that we were able to provide this uh, platform to um, talk about these. I hope that your questions were answered and um, want to let you all know that these, uh, this, will be, this talk is being recorded and will be made available um, in the coming weeks. So once again, I want to thank all 184 of you for coming and uh, hope you have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, um, Kevin. That was really great. Uh, we see a whole bunch of questions in there. Um, we may attempt to try and answer some of these and um, post them if possible with the, um, the recording. I don't know if that's going to be possible or not, but um, I would like to echo Kevin's comments there. And um, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for your interest. We're, uh, we're, we're happy, to, happy to see it. And hopefully we do something similar similar to this in the not too um, distant future. But for that, I would like to thank um, all the panelists for their presentations, um, the organizers, and of course, the, um, the audience participants for, uh, for your interest and your fantastic questions. So without further ado, we would wish you a good evening. Thank you very much. Bye from California Sea Grant and Save Our Shores.